it's because it's not because my training has been so amazing that the horse will do anything and everything from blind obedience and it will appear to be bond because the horse will just do it um it's because Hey there, welcome to another episode of the Willing Equine Podcast. I'll be recording this episode in my car, so the audio may not be super clear, and sometimes I have my kids with me, so if you hear a little bit from them, I apologize, but hopefully you can still enjoy the podcast. I'd love to hear from you after you listen to the podcast, so feel free to comment on any of my social media platforms or email me or even send me an anchor voice message. Hi Adele, what is your opinion on horse-human bond, or so-called relationship with the horse? Do you think it really exists? If so, how does it look like? And what is your opinion on horse trainers, especially that use negative reinforcement that show tactless riding as proof of such relationship? Thank you. The horse-human bond. Um, you know, the idea of a horse bonding or bond, I don't know, the word bond is a little anthropomorphic in my opinion, in that we're attributing human ideals and thoughts and emotions and feelings to our horses. We do know that horses bond with other horses. We know that they create or they can have really connection, connected relationships. So like, um, they can be more attached, that's the better word, the more attached to a specific another horse like I have I have one herd that has five horses in it and two of them in particular are very closely quote-unquote bonded they um, do not separate very well they you know they're fine when they're with their herd I can take away one and leave them with their herd but they struggle more than if I take away a different horse from that same herd. So this is actually, I'm speaking of my mares, Tiger and Pumpkin, and they have known each other for, uh, it's gotta be like six years now. I've had them and they, five, six years now. And so they've been together for a long time, much longer than anybody else in the herd. You know, River's only been in there for three years. Um, Finn has only been in there for a couple months, maybe even a month now. And then Cashmere's in that same herd, and she's been there since last August, so almost a year. So um, Pumpkin and Tiger just are really attached. They don't want to be separated. They don't want one of them to leave and the other one to be left. So I consider them a bonded pair in that they have developed this really close relationship together. Now, what has developed that relationship is it just that there's this genetic predisposition to attach to the other horse is there something spiritual or deeper and emotional development that happens that connects two horses together and it doesn't necessarily have to do so much with how long they've been together or um, anything else it's just that they happen to be really bonded they just have this bond together or is it because they happen to, or not happen to, but they have developed a very close relationship because they have been together the longest. They have learned each other's body language really well. They never argue with each other. They never, um, arguing isn't even a correct term. So they never, uh, they never get into tiffs with each other. They never will... Um, Tiger will occasionally put her ears back at Pumpkin, but they generally have a very smooth relationship. They understand each other. They can, you know, be in very tight quarters with each other without there being an issue. They trust the other horse because they have had such a long um, history together that they know that they can trust the other horse, that they know that that horse is going to be around, that they're not going anywhere, you know, that's that's the what history has proven to them that that horse is going to stick around, um, and they have just developed this relationship where they lead each other to and from water and to and from food. Um, they train together, they live together, everything they do is together. So they have cr created this relationship, and a lot of that, I think, crosses over into the horse-human bond. 
and I'm hesitant to ever use that word bond just because I don't feel like it accurately describes what's happening, but I'm going to continue to use it for the rest of this podcast just because it's brief and easy to explain. So with horse human bonds, I think it's very similar. Typically when you see whether or not the person is training with negative reinforcement or positive reinforcement or whatever, it doesn't even really matter. The ones that seem to have the most bond, the most quote unquote bond, and that seem to just do really, really well together, the horse and the human, they just seem to be interconnected. They seem to almost be reading each other's thoughts. Those that it's usually a pair that has been together for an extended period or have trained extensively together for hours and hours and hours and hours together. So there's this this subtle communication that happens that is not necessarily readily available to the observer. So we can watch a horse and a human interact together and we can we just don't even really see what's happening, how the horse is understanding what, what to do or how to do it or um, we haven't seen the process that it took you know, for them to get from when they first got together and they had to use all this equipment or or they were working in protected contact, so they weren't even really doing anything. They were just sitting there and just getting to know each other. Um, or in the other scenario where they were using all of this equipment so that they made sure that the horse would stop or didn't stop or whatever it is. And then we fast forward years and years, and then we see them riding around bridalists and you know uh, going out to the beach and tackless riding through the waves and all these mythical magical romantic moments with our horses that we all want we all want that with our horses or at least I do and I know a lot of people do um so how do those people get there if not by bond you know by this special unique connection with their horse well it's not really so mythical in that it's just like I explained where it's a long history together of learned communication. So the horse has learned over time how to read the human's subtle cues. So whether or not the human thinks they're cueing behaviors or telling the horse what to do, they are. Horses are masters at picking up cues and so it doesn't matter how you train, they will see and feel and hear and you know everything they will know what is going to predict what so you know maybe in the beginning it was that you had to um, kind of really push into the horse or wave your whip or whatever to get them to back up and then at the very you know years later you just have to kind of look at them and they start backing up it's easy for an observer to say, oh my gosh, look at that bond. That horse is so well-trained or so obedient or, or, um, and they are, but you know, it's easy to say, I can't, how are you able to ride on the beach bridleless and with all these other crazy horses around and your horse is perfectly behaved and will just lay down in the middle of chaos and it's so beautiful and so much, you guys have such a great bond and such a great connection and Um, when I'm not going to say every time, but from my experience, it's just the result of really good training. doesn't matter what the type of training is. It's, and I'm not saying good as in from an ethical perspective, I'm talking about effective. That would be the better word. It's very effective and consistent and well thought out and, um, well-timed training that over the years has built and built and built until these behaviors happen and from very subtle cues in a large variety of environments with distractions, without distractions, with chaos going around. Uh, So it's very easy to observe what appears to be bond, (laughs) um, but which is in reality, excellent or effective training. And that going into your next question can come from any type of training. Um, You can be an effective negative reinforcement trainer and you can be an effective positive reinforcement trainer um, or a positive punishment trainer or whatever you want to say, natural horsemanship, traditional, it doesn't matter. Whatever type of training, you can be effective in any type of training that you want to use. It's more about the history of the training and your relationship with that training and that horse over the years. So there are people that will have horses that actually I'm going to come back to that. So when 
so to, which I kind of already somewhat answered, but when you have somebody that is a negative reinforcement trainer, which is just fine, there's no problem with that, um, and they say that they have bond, a bond with their horse, my, typically my response or my thought is, is no, you're just a really good trainer. And um, you probably have built that history, a, a little bit of a history of predictability with your horse. Not a little bit, a lot of it. A lot of predictableness in your relationship. And so it's not really this mythical thing. It's something that is measurable and can be achieved by anybody. It just needs to be a goal, meaning that you need to, you, you want that and you're working towards it and you have to really work on how effective your training is, how consistent you are, how predictable you are to the horse and how patient you are and being clear and having goals, um, training, like measurable goals in your training so that the horse understands what's coming next, you know, what we're working towards, and you can easily repeat all of it. And so, like I said, that happens with any training. So it's not isolated to positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement, which is, anyway, you get the point. Um, but there is an added... I, I think what we're all looking for that's something separate from what's actually happening is a relationship with our horse um, and trust, our horse having trust in us and, um, and a willingness to work with us and, and to do, participate in the training. So when, I, when, when people say bond, I think they're talking about what looks like really good training. But there's this whole other category, a whole different thing that I think we're all actually looking for, and it's what we're actually wanting it to be when we say we have a bond with our horse. But it's not necessarily something that everybody's able to, or you can achieve, everybody can achieve it, but most people have not achieved this. They are, it's just about the good training, but a different level, something else that happens on a different level, the, an emotional connection, a, um, a relationship with your horse. This is a little bit different and has very little to do with intentional training. We're, we're always training. There's always opera and classical conditioning happening. So we can't get away from that, but it's different than, oh, my horse will lay down on a beach because my horses won't lay down on a beach, but I would consider myself, I would consider, I would say that my horses have an excellent relationship with me and that they trust me and that, um, it would be more what I would consider to be a bond with my horse in that I understand them. I can just take, take one look at them in the pasture that day and I can see how they're feeling and I respect that and I work with it and my horses also respond very well to me um, and they will go above and beyond for me even when I put them in really tough situations. So it'll be something maybe we haven't necessarily trained for, or it's particularly stressful or scary or whatever. And it's above and beyond what the training has accomplished, but the horse will respond in a way that I'm just like blows my mind. I'm like, I cannot believe my horse just, you know, went through that with me. Um, a good example of this might be, when my Philly River had a bunch of surgeries, we had insufficient training for what it is I put her through. I, I tried very hard to match her training to what I was going to ask of her, um, but she was young and I had just had a newborn baby uh, and had had not been training a lot with her recently and when we had to do the surgery. So I put her through a lot. I took her I took her to new environments. I, um, I, she had to be handled by different people. She had to have x-rays and injections and laid down and, you know, woken back up again in new environments. She hadn't been anywhere outside of my own property since she arrived. Actually, I think I took her one time to a different place. It was very, very brief and she hadn't 
really had any medical care, so to speak, um, besides just normal maintenance stuff. And she hadn't been really handled by anybody else. But because I had spent so much time into building a relationship and showing her that she could trust me and that, that there would be a positive outcome from this situation, she went through it all with me without so much as blinking an eye. She blew my mind in how trusting she was and how much she put up with and how much she, how well she coped with what I was putting her through. And I think that that was a result. I'm pretty confident in saying that that was a result of building a trust bank with her. So what I mean by trust bank is, and this is what I think of when I say I have a bond with my horses or I have a relationship with my horses or my horses are willing um, equines and they're willing horses. A trust bank is when you show the horse over and over and over and over again that there will be a positive outcome from this encounter. So every single interaction with your horse, every single training and uh, session, every single thing you do, anybody else does, you're depositing a little bit of money into that bank. So you're depositing some money into the bank every single time. And if you can build that bank account so big that it's just overflowing, it's overflowing with everything is positive, everything is amazing and glorious and beautiful, that if you have to subtract some, if you have to go into a stressful environment, if you have to ask too much of your horse, if you have to put them through something that's scary or, um, or painful, it will subtract a little bit from, it'll withdraw from the bank account something, some, you know, amount, it'll pull away from some money, some of that positive money we've put in there. Um, but it won't empty the bank account. It will, there still will be plenty there. There will still be so much trust still there because you've built up this trust bank so much that a little setback here or there or a little negative situation that comes up or even something that's somewhat traumatic. Um, if the bank account is big enough, it won't have a long lasting impact and your horse will still look forward to interacting with you and be willing and will trust you um, up until a certain point where you start withdrawing and you start over drafting your account. So you start withdrawing money that is not there. Um, and this is what happens a lot in our interactions with horses and training when we come from a background where we're starting to seek new types of training because our horses are um, poorly behaved, they're dangerous, they're frightened, they're scared, um, they're acting up, they're lashing out, they're acting, you know, just all these things that we don't want them to do. These horses are running an overdrafted bank account and they don't trust people. Uh, they have no reason to trust us. Uh, we haven't given them the reason to. So these are horses that have not developed a good relationship with people and um, or they're in pain and the pain has resulted in creating negative associations with the people so the people unknowingly are withdrawing from the account every time they ride every time they interact with the horse because interacting with the person it causes a negative feeling or uh, emotional state. So the human is like, oh, we're going to go on this nice trail ride. But if the horse, if the saddle is painful, then that whole trail ride was um, a negative experience for that horse. So it was a withdrawal from the bank account. So it can be a little bit tough. It can be a little bit tough to know. Sometimes um, you kind of accidentally do things and you look back you're like oh, shoot uh, that was not what I meant that to be like I thought it was gonna be fun and enjoyable um, but it wasn't so this is why paying attention to equine behavior and um, body language and calming signals and displacement behaviors is so very important so very important um, to avoid making too many withdrawals from the bank account so when I speak say I have a bond with my horse, which I don't really say when I have a relationship with my horse, when I have a horse that trusts me, when I feel connected with the horse, when I feel like I could ask something of them stressful and they would respond willingly when I've gotten to that point, it's because it's not because my training has been so amazing that the horse will do anything and everything from blind obedience and it will appear to be bond because the horse will just do it. Um, it's because that horse has put 
has built up or I have built up such a big trust account in that horse where that horse knows that there will be a positive outcome sooner or later from this situation that they will let me, you know, they they'll let me go above and beyond or push them a little bit further than I might normally um, because they trust me. That to me is what most people are saying or thinking when they say there's a bond with that horse. But like I've said multiple times, most of the time that's not what's actually happening. I will see people lay down a horse um, or, yeah, let's go back to the beach scenario. You, You know, you're at the beach and you ask your horse to lay down and the horse plops down in the sands. All right. So depending on how that was trained, though, that doesn't necessarily mean that the horse wanted to lay down, that the horse was so willing to lay down and so trustful that it just gently plopped to the ground and was like, yes, human, I would love to just for you because I love you so much. Most of the time, not most of the time, but a lot of the time, that's not the case. If you look back at how that behavior was trained or the entire training experience for that horse, um, that lay down might have been done through an aversive pressure or through punishment or um, just in a manipulative way where... um, where maybe the horse was tied, you know, like a leg was tied up and then they were dropped down. Um, And the horse just learns that when the human cues to lay down, I need to lay down. It doesn't matter if I'm at home, if I'm in the arena, if I'm in my stall, if I'm on the beach, I must lay down or else. And so that's not a bond. Um, That's just effective training. Is it ethical training? I don't know. I can't tell you as far as I'd have to look at the individual situation and then it would be based off of my personal opinions. Um, But the longest short answer really is there's a difference between training, effective training, thorough training, training that will not fail in um, any given situation. And what I consider a trusting and willing equine partner, a horse that will go above and beyond for me, beyond the training, beyond what they know and they've been taught and will go through thick and thin with me because I have built up such a strong bank account of trust, such a positive relationship with that horse that the horse is like, it's going to be closer to what we kind of wish a bond would be, which is that horse that's like, yes, human, I love you so much. I would happily do anything for you. Climb on my back. Let's ride off into the sunset. That to me, you know, the closest we're going to get to something like that, you know, a horse thinking that and wanting to do that for us is through building a positive relationship with the horse and showing them that we can be trusted, that we will be the bearer of good things, that we will bring them only good things and and show them good things and um, be trustworthy people. Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to find out more, head to my website, thewillingequine.com. On there, I have a really extensive blog. I'm a very prolific writer. And I also have a an FAQ page. And the FAQ has all kinds of things. It has questions and answers about training and about my training specifically, as well as just general about working with positive reinforcement. There's also sections on there about health and um, behavior. So all of that. I'm also on a lot of different social media platforms, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. So check those out. And I'd love to hear from you. So don't hesitate to email or send me a message. 